Daniel chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be examined before you and the countenances of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. And as you see fit, so deal with your servants." So he consented with them in this matter and tested them ten days. And at the end of ten days their countenance appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus the steward took away their portion of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. Then the king interviewed them, and among them all none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore they served before the king. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding about which the king examined them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. Thus Daniel, Daniel continued until the first year of King Cyrus. Will you join me please in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for your word, and God, I pray that you'll open up our hearts to the great teaching and prophecy of this wonderful book, and you'll prepare us that we might be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. We might know how to live in this secular society that's so much like ancient Babylon. Help us, Lord, to be like Daniel, to purpose in our heart to live for you and not to defile ourselves. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we call it Dare to Be a Daniel. I don't know about you, but years ago in Sunday school, we sang this song, Dare to Be a Daniel, Dare to Stand Alone, Dare to Have a Purpose Firm, Dare to Make It Known, Dare to Be a Daniel. Uh, this passage was used in various ways. Take my mom and dad, for instance. Whenever I made any remark at our table concerning vegetables, <laughs> I was reminded of Daniel. Parents have used this for years, I don't know how successfully, to urge their kids to eat vegetables. But what a story it is. But we need to know a little bit more about Daniel. First of all, we believe Daniel wrote the book. You say, well, it says Daniel. Did you know there are very few people who believe that Daniel wrote the book? The only ones I know are ones who believe the Bible is the inspired and errant Word of God. I have a ton of commentaries on Daniel. Most of them say it's somebody else. They cannot believe that Daniel 
who lived at the time of the Babylonian captivity, wrote this book. There are lots of reasons why they believe this book had to be written after, after Antiochus Epiphanes, who ruled and uh, conquered uh, Jerusalem and desecrated the uh, rebuilt temple by sacrificing a pig on it, the time of the Maccabees, about 167 to 164 B.C. They say whoever wrote it had to live after that time. Why? Because Daniel predicts in great detail all of the nations of the world from Babylon on. He explains that it's going to be Medo-Persia before they ever existed. He explains there will be a Greece before it ever happened. He explains the breakup of Alexander the Great's empire into four generals. Uh, he also explains the coming of the Roman Empire. He also explains uh, in the breakup of Alexander the Great's Grecian Empire, uh, the battles of the Ptolemies and the Seleucids over Israel. He gives it blow by blow, king by king, and the historical accuracy of Daniel chapter 11 is unquestioned. Therefore, people who read it say there's no way he could have written it before it happened because if you believe that, then you'd have to believe <laughs> Isn't prophecy a wonderful thing? This is a wonderful book. The book of Daniel is the number one reason why many liberal preachers do not believe the Bible is the Word of God. Number one, it's the book of Daniel. We know Daniel was in the lion's den, but let me tell you, it's been in the critics' den for a long time. Ever since the third century A.D., believe it or not, there were people writing against this book because they cannot believe. There isn't a book of the Bible that is so clearly predictive in its prophecy and so accurate and so substantiated by history outside of it. So they don't want to accept Daniel. Now, did Daniel write the book? Chapter 7, please. Chapter 7, verse 2. Let's just take a little introductory look at the book. Daniel chapter 7, verse 2. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night. Sounds like he saw it. Verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body. Sounds like he wrote it. He was grieved. Verse 28. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and so on. Uh, chapter 8, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. To me, Daniel. It's almost like he's anticipating the criticism of the future. I want you to know that I got the vision. You know, me, Daniel. Amen. Look at verse 15. It says, Now it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision. It amuses me because there's hardly a book in the Bible that so continually identifies the author as the book of Daniel. It's as though the, the sovereignty of God, God anticipates the criticism that will be given of this book. Uh, look at verse 27. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick for days. And afterward, I arose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Chapter 9, verse 2. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet. Uh, chapter 9, verse 22. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Uh, chapter 10, verse 2. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. Uh, verse 7, and I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. Uh, verse 11, he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man greatly beloved. Verse 12, do not fear Daniel. You're getting the point? Chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Verse 5, then I, Daniel, looked. You see, folks, there is no mistake about it. Somebody named Daniel wrote this book. Amen? Amen? Now, this man who wrote this book is recognized for his tremendous wisdom. Look at Daniel chapter 1, verse 4. It's a very interesting fact. It says that young men were chosen whom there was no blemish. They were good-looking. They were gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge, and quick to understand. Notice chapter 2, verse 48. Then the king promoted Daniel, gave him many great gifts, 
made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief administrator over all the wise men of Babylon. Imagine God putting his servant in that, that place. Chapter 5, verse 11. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. So his wisdom, uh, his leadership is presented. It's one of the great stories of the Bible, how God takes one of his servants and puts them in an unusual place in a secular culture uh, to be used mightily by him. Now the events and the names of the book of Daniel clearly show that it's the time of the Babylonian captivity. That's the 6th century B.C. And it also indicates the conquest of Babylon by the Medes and the Persians. And we'll talk more about that as we move along. There's something unusual about Daniel. There's a long Aramaic section of Daniel. Aramaic is a form of Hebrew. It's a Semitic language. It was a language spoken by our Lord and His disciples at the time of the writing of the New Testament. In the first century A.D., the Jews in Israel spoke Aramaic. Now, this Aramaic language was the language of the court and the nobility of the Babylonians. And uh, most of the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. But from chapter 2, verse 46 of the book of Daniel to chapter 7, verse 28, the entire section is all in Aramaic, not Hebrew. Very unusual. People say, well, why? And the basic reason, I believe, is because Aramaic was what was spoken by the people. And the purpose of that section is to relate to that culture and to really tell them about the story of Daniel, his visions, and his life in Babylon. Something they would know about and was communicated in their own language. Another interesting thing, the book employs the use of 17 Persian words. But the Persian Empire uh, comes to power within the context and history of the book. 17 Persian words. There are also three Greek words. Many people say, well, the Greek words alone say it couldn't have been written until after Alexander the Great. But Greek was in usage long before Alexander, and the passage that deals with the three Greek words deal with musical instruments. All three words are Greek musical instruments. And that's understandable because the Greek culture, which dated before Alexander the Great and was in existence, though not powerful, the Greek culture had um, instruments and they had lots of music and they were the ones importing and exporting uh, musical instruments uh, all over the then known world. So that isn't surprising at all. Now many people say, well, because of the Aramaic, this could not have written by Daniel in the Babylonian captivity. And I'll tell you why. In 1947, when we uncovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are copies of every book of the Bible, really, except one. Not Daniel, another book, Esther. But there are copies of all the books of the Bible in the Dead Sea Scrolls, fragments. One of the most beautiful and well-preserved is the prophecy of Isaiah, and it is in a giant shrine in the city of Jerusalem called the Shrine of the Book. And there are many, many uh, manuscripts from the Bible in addition to the manuscripts from the Bible found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there are also books written in Aramaic. Now, the date of the Dead Sea Scrolls uh, varies between 250 B.C. to 150 B.C. And so their argument is these Aramaic books probably explain the presence of Aramaic in the Hebrew. And therefore, it could not have been written back in the 5th century B.C., but had to be written... Uh, after um, 165 B.C. or so on. My answer to that, um, although this is a small detail, but maybe somebody in the audience cares. But anyway, it may be a small detail, but it's important to me, and I hope it's important to you, because those kind of things will be shared from the pulpits of America to pro prove that Daniel's not really uh, to be trusted as predictive prophecy, that it had to be written by somebody after the fact. But the interesting thing about Aramaic, and forgive me for boring you a little bit about language, but the word order of Aramaic uh, in Daniel is not the word order, grammatically, of the Aramaic and the Dead Sea Scrolls. In Daniel, you have an interesting variation in Aramaic. It goes subject, object, 
and verb in the sentences instead of subject, verb, and object, as it is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Subject, object, and then verb, that kind of grammatical order, is used in the 7th century B.C. in documents that we know about. So you see the fact that this was written in the 1st century, or the 5th century uh, B.C. is very explainable because the grammatical order of the Aramaic was in usage before that time and later changes to the word order and grammar of that which is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So instead of disproving the book of Daniel, the Aramaic style actually proves that Daniel is predictive prophecy and was in existence long before the historical information that is in the book. All that to say, I believe the book was written when God said it was, and I believe it's predictive prophecy, and I believe it's one of the greatest proofs to any of us that the Bible is the Word of God and that we better pay attention to prophecy. Okay, enough said. Now, the outline of the book. Daniel's divided in two sections. First six chapters, and then the last six chapters. Two sections. In the first six chapters, I call that the prominence and prosperity of Daniel. And in those six chapters, you have the following things. You don't need to write them down. Just kind of listen. We'll go over them each time. But in the prominence and prosperity of Daniel, as you watch how God brings him to great power and authority to be the third ruler in the whole kingdom of Babylon, the following things happen. In chapter 1, you see the development of Daniel and his three friends. Number 2, in chapter 2, you see the dream of Nebuchadnezzar about future nations. And Daniel answers it. Number three, in chapter three, you see the decree of the fiery furnace and how God uses that. Uh, Four, you see the second dream of Nebuchadnezzar about himself in chapter four. In chapter five, you have a description of Babylon's fall. And by the way, history substantiates that's exactly accurate in Daniel chapter five. In chapter 6, you see the den of lions. And all these events were used by God to bring Daniel to the place of prominence in Babylon. Actually, that whole story tells me that the theme is the sovereignty of God. How God takes us in, in a pagan culture and uses us for His glory when we decide to stand alone and we will not compromise. The message of Daniel is for all of us today. We live in a modern Babylon. We live in a pagan secular culture, and the message of Daniel is learn to stand alone. Learn to say, I'm not going to defile myself. I'm going to walk with God no matter what, and watch how God will bless you. It reminds me of Joseph. Remember the same thing happened to Joseph. And Joseph was prospered by God because he was faithful to the Lord. Great, great section of Daniel. Then in the last six chapters of Daniel, we have the predictions and prophecies of Daniel. Very interesting section of Scripture. In fact, let's just take a quick glance at it. Look at chapter 7, please, verse 1. You'll see what I mean, how this whole section are the predictions and prophecies. In Daniel 7, 1, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. And he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Verse 13, I was watching in the night visions. Verse 15, I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. Uh, Verse 28, this is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, but I kept the matter in my heart. Imagine having a vision of accurate history that hasn't happened yet. You can imagine how troubling that would be to your heart. Uh, In chapter 8, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me after the one that appeared to me the first time. Uh, Verse 27, and I, Daniel, fainted, was sick for days. Afterward, I rose and went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision, but no one understood it. Uh, In chapter 9, verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord. It was 70, by the way, given through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Uh, Verse 23, same chapter. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I've come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Uh, Chapter 10, in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a message was revealed to Daniel. 
Uh, we read in chapter 10, verse 14. Now I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision refers to many days yet to come. Uh, chapter 12, verse 8 and 9. Chapter 12, verse 8 and 9. Although I had heard, I did not understand. Then I said, My Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Daniel has some visions and dreams that God gives him that predict the future about the historical nations that would rule immediately after Babylon, as well as carrying it clear into the eternal state and the kingdom of our Lord. If you would outline these last six chapters, you have in chapter 7, the coming of future kingdoms. Very important prophecy because you can see it unfold right in front of our eyes now. In chapter 8, you have the clash of the ram and goat. And that's dealing with Persia and Greece. Very fascinating. In chapter 9, you have the confession of Daniel in the first 19 verses. And then you have the covenant of a future prince in chapter 9, verses 20 to 27, uh, called the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy. Probably the most crucial prophecy in the entire Bible in terms of dating, chronology. Uh, in chapter 10, you have the consecration of Daniel himself. And in chapter 11, the conflicts of future kings. And it goes all the way into the future, but maps out things that happened before the time of Christ as well. Uh, in chapter 12, you have the completion of all things and a wonderful prophecy about every, how everything's going to wind up. This is the little revelation of the Bible along with Zechariah, and it is tremendous prophecy. Well, let's go to chapter 1 and take a look at it. In chapter 1, we see the development of Daniel and his three friends. And I'd like you to notice in the opening seven verses the circumstances that brought them to Babylon. The circumstances that brought them to Babylon. And the first thing that is mentioned in the opening two verses is the invasion of Nebuchadnezzar. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Now, the details of the Bible are incredible in the book of Daniel. And I'm going to point those out as we go along, and you're going to see that we know outside of the Bible, from secular history, we know about the facts that are recorded in the book of Daniel. And it's wonderful to the heart of the believer to see that. Now, Nebuchadnezzar comes into Babylon three times. Write down the dates. Number one, he comes in 606 B.C. At that moment, he takes captives, a few captives to Babylon, and he takes a lot of treasures. That's the third year of Jehoiakim. The first time he comes in, he comes in at 606 B.C. He leaves in 605 B.C. The second time he comes is in 597 B.C. And that's when Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, was exiled to Babylon. By the way, Ezekiel knew about Daniel, obviously. He refers to Daniel three times in the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 14, verse 14 and 20, and chapter 28, verse 3. So Ezekiel goes in on the second captivity and invasion of Nebuchadnezzar. The third invasion is when he finally destroys Jerusalem and burns it to the ground, 586 B.C. So it's very interesting when you look at his three invasions. Now the question is, why didn't Nebuchadnezzar wipe out Jerusalem on the first invasion? First of all, a Babylonian tablet that we have in the British Museum says that he conquered all of the Hatti country. That was controlled by the ancient Hittite empire, and that involves Syria, Phoenicia, and Israel. It says he conquered it all. Well, the Babylonian Chronicle tells us why he didn't conquer Jerusalem and burn it and destroy it, even though he wanted to. Why did he leave so abruptly, taking Daniel and his friends with him and some articles out of the temple, though he didn't destroy the temple? And the answer is that in the Babylonian uh, Chronicle, it states that Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nabopolassar, died in August of 605 B.C., and it made Nebuchadnezzar's return to Babylon a necessity before anybody else would take the throne. 
He became king the day he arrived, which was in September of 605 B.C. Took him about a month to get back, and he took all of his armies and made the trek of over 600 miles and got back quickly because the report came to him that his father had died. And that explains why he didn't carry out the destruction of Jerusalem at that moment. Now, in the Bible, in verse 2, it says he took the articles into the house of God. Well, they were never taken back until the decree of Cyrus, the Persian, under the leader Zerubbabel. That's recorded in Ezra 1-7. And the rest of it went back under Darius, the Persian, according to Ezra 6-5. Now, I'm going to tell you this for one reason. In the Babylonian Chronicles, it tells us exactly what is recorded in Daniel chapter 1, verse 2. It even names the total amount of articles that he took, over 580 of them. Treasures out of the temple area that he took back. It may be a small thing to you. It's not to me. Because the history verifies it. And, and it's interesting, I don't need secular history to verify the Bible at all. Because I've discovered that even when secular history disagrees, archaeological discovery will prove that the secular history has been wrong all along. And I'll give you an example. In the Bible's list of wars from nations of Assyria, which is the empire before Babylon, there's an Assyrian list of kings. But in the Bible, uh, the name Sargon is not mentioned. And yet we know he was a powerful king. Or excuse me, the other way around. Sargon is mentioned in the Bible as a king, but he's not on the Assyrian list of kings. Now, several years ago, I went to the Oriental Museum in Chicago to the Assyrian room and took a look at this. It's an, a kind of an obelisk stone. It's quite uh, high, and it's uh, like uh, almost eight sides on it. And on, it, on this stone are listed all the Assyrian kings, but Sargon's name is not on it. When this was discovered, the University of Chicago put out the rule, uh, the word, that they had found one glowing, clear contradiction in the Bible. And they tried to be real sympathetic for the Bible, that probably Sargon was a name that was um, a, a type, an allegory of somebody. But since it wasn't on the Assyrian list on the stone, then obviously the Bible is wrong. Now, what happened in the course of events is kind of amusing. They not only in archaeological found the name of Sargon, but they found his whole palace and his name engraved in every brick. <laughs> now that's like God's little funny joke for all of us to remember that history sometimes catches up with the Bible. And ancient history is known to be very inaccurate. Do you know we also know from ancient history why Sargon's name was taken off? Because he was such a powerful ruler, exactly like the Bible discusses, the guy following him wiped out every vestige of his name that he could find and never put him on the Assyrian list of kings. It's amusing when you see it. Uh, the main admonition to all of us, just wait. History catches up with the Bible, our knowledge of it. But the interesting thing is that the Babylonian Chronicles do record that the articles out of the temple were taken by Nebuchadnezzar at the first invasion, exactly like the Bible says, because it has a date for us, the third year of Jehoiakim, and it's exactly what happened. And I just say, praise the Lord. Now, it said he took them into the house of his God. The number one God of the Babylonian system was named Bel. The Messiah of the Babylonian system, if you want to put it that way, is Marduk. And there's a famous temple of Marduk in ancient Babylon. Interesting, the son of Nebuchadnezzar was named Evil Merodach in honor of Marduk. So he brings all the articles, these sacred articles used in the worship of the temple of the Jews. He takes them to Babylon and puts them in the house of a pagan god. Now, mind you, Daniel would know about all of that. Just interesting background. Now, another circumstance I draw to your attention is in verses 3 to 7, the instruction that's given to this man named Ashpenaz. Now, look at verse 3. It says he's the master of his eunuchs. The word master in the actual Hebrew text is Rob Saris. You say, I don't care. <laughs> well, let me tell you why you should care. Rob Saris, that name called Master of the Eunuchs, for many, many years never appeared in any history whatsoever. And liberal critics said, there is a clear example why the Bible is just a bunch of myths. 
this Ash Panaz, master of the eunuchs. There is no such master of the eunuchs. There is no Rob Saris, this particular job with such importance ever in any of the Babylonian history. Well, you know that's interesting because we found a conical brick in which the exact name is listed and you can go visit it in the British Museum. And I've seen it. And I, I once again say to you, it may be a small little deal to you, but it's not a small deal to me. I believe the Bible is the Word of God, that its events and chronolo chronology and history and times are given to us exactly correct. And it only takes a matter of time to prove it. Now, in the instruction given to this Ash Penaz, the master of the eunuchs, uh, he was told to bring some of the children of Israel to Babylon. And Nebuchadnezzar is going to take the brightest young men and he's going to change them. And he's going to show to all the Jews what he can do to their best young men. Now, the goal here, you have to think about it. It's something that ancient monarchs love to do. Take the best young men out of a conquered culture and turn them into Babylonians and prove that people really, if they were taught well, would rather prefer your way of life than the one they had. So that's behind all of this. The prerequisites are in verse 4. We want guys that are good looking. Uh, we want them without blemish. So health and appearance were factors as well as knowledge and ability. They wanted the very best young men that the Israeli society could provide. Now, the plan is outlined in verses 5 to 7 for us, and it involved three things that were to be altered. Now, people, listen carefully right now and ask yourself if this isn't what our society is doing to us. Three things they wanted to alter about these Jewish young men. One was their mental capacity. They wanted them to think differently. So we're going to teach them the language and literature of the Chaldeans. We're going to change the way they think. These young men who were trained in Jewish thought and literature, followed the Torah, the law of God, these young men are now going to be trained in all the ways of the world. How many of you have gone to school that have trained you in all the ways of the world? Amen. <laughs> Lots of us have. And the sad thing is that many people have been affected by the ways of the world. Several years ago, I was um, confronted by students that were in our, my church. It was in uh, Long Beach at the time. There were students at Long Beach State University who were being really influenced by a particular class. I decided to attend it, to audit it. So I went, <laughs> trying to make a firm commitment not to talk, which is very hard for me. <laughs> but anyway, I sat in that class to hear this teacher now, the first thing that surprised me is that he was teaching theories about the Bible and religion that were at least 25 to 30 years old. So the guy certainly wasn't keeping up. I could have given him better liberal arguments, but he was using very old theories to try to snow the students. Now, the day I came to class the first time, because I missed several when I came in, but the very first day I came, the discussion was dealing with evolution. And he was on the subject of paleontology, the structure of the earth's surface. Now, if I hadn't have been there, I wouldn't have believed it. But I sat in that class, about 200 students, I was sitting in the back. And he was trying to explain uh, that the whole business of fossils in a given structure uh, proves the dating of the Bible, or the dating of history, and proves the Bible is incorrect. And uh, he was going on to this, and what he said was, that by the nature of the fossils in a given structure, that determines how old that strata is. That was his basic argument. So students were cruising along listening to this. And one little guy in the front row raised his hand. And the teacher was obviously annoyed. It's a large class. It wasn't time for a lot of discussion. All right, what is it? The kid said, well, how do you know how old the fossils are? I mean, a very simple question. The teacher said, by the strata in which it appears. And he continued teaching. I wonder what anybody was going to do. You know, what really bothers me is all students who are trained in the worldly secularism of our day, they were saying things like, oh, right, heavy man, great, you know. I mean, showing the stupidity of all of us, buying into that. Well, this little kid was troubled. 
So about five minutes later, he raises his hand again. The teacher says, what is it now? You know, one of those real thrilling responses from your teacher that makes you want to talk to him. What is it now? And the little kid said, well, how do you know how old the strata is? And you know exactly what he said. He said, by the fossils that appear in it. I mean, I couldn't believe it. You know, I had used uh, a lot of things from preaching uh, to, to illustrate how the world thinks. But there I am sitting in this class, Ph.D. from a European university, and he is saying that. That's just reasoning in a circle. It's dumb, dumb, dumb. But, you know, people bow down at that. Oh, that's really great. Really. Do you know something? In this society, we've got to do exactly what Daniel did. We've got to decide whether we're going to defile ourselves with the thinking of the world. Turn to Colossians, please, chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. The plan of attack here is to change the mental capacity and thinking patterns of these Jewish young men who are committed to God. To infiltrate their minds with secular thought and all the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 6. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Be very careful what you're listening to. Back to Daniel chapter 1. The second thing they wanted to do is change their social customs. Change the social customs. Verse 5, uh, they provided the king's delicacies. Don't you wish you knew what kind of food it was? Doesn't say. My dad used to say that means desserts and they're bad for you. <laughs> the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank. So they had a plan to change their social customs. Is everybody listening? It seems to me that Christians walk to the drumbeat of secular society in terms of social custom. It seems to me that instead of teaching young people how to stand alone and to oppose it, we allow the peer group pressure of what they experience on campus to teach them what is the social custom they should buy. And for years now, we've compromised, oh, in our attitude to be cool or communicative or not have people think we're odd or different or whatever, we have adapted to the point that I think we've compromised, frankly. It seems more important now to dress like the unbeliever, to talk like the unbeliever, to go to places where the unbeliever goes, uh, to experience the party time of the unbelievers, to do it all, but, oh, be sure to make, uh, make this clear in your heart that you do have your ticket to heaven. But just do whatever the world wants you to do. Even though the Bible says, don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world. But we buy into it. And after all, we want our kids to be accepted and liked. Really. I think it's time for a change. How about you? It's time for a confrontation of the culture. It's time to teach young people, hey, God's always used kids for Christ. Stop thinking about what you're going to do later on. Let's get turned on for God now and let's have kids who know how to stand alone and will not defile themselves and will confront the culture and be the leaders that God wants you to be. If you can't stand against the crowd, the chances are you'll never learn to be a leader in the small things of life. We need to understand this is a matter of conviction, a matter of standing for what's right and not letting people tell you what to do or following a pattern or going along with a bunch of kids who are doing something. It's very important what we're reading here. The plan changed the way they think and changed their social customs. The third thing they decided to do was to affect their religious convictions. It's interesting what they decided to do, change their name. So every time their name is spoken, it reminds them of pagan culture rather than the Word of God. In verse 6, we learn the names of these men were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah. And their names were changed to Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now let me show you the significance of this. Daniel means God is my judge. But Belteshazzar is referring to the prince of Bel and probably as a statement 
may Bel, by the way, the god Bel, the highest god of the Babylonian pantheon, is mentioned in Isaiah 46, verse 1. But anyway, it means that Bel, may Bel protect his life. So instead of the Lord's protection, and the Lord is my judge, and I'm accountable to him, they want me to appeal to a pagan god, may he protect my life. Interesting. They're trying to change his religious thinking and his convictions. When they came to Hananiah, Hananiah means the Lord is gracious. What a wonderful name to have, to always remember the grace and loving kindness of the Lord to you. Changing it to Shadrach is referring to Rock, who was the sun deity. And it means to be illumined by the sun deity. So instead of experiencing the wonderful grace and kindness of the Lord, we're thinking about how a pagan god, the sun deity, will somehow brighten our life. When you come to Mishael, Mishael means who is what God is. It's a lot like Michael, the name Michael. Uh, who is like God. It's just a little difference. Mishael is who is what God is. It's a wonderful name reminding us to live like the Lord and have godly lifestyle in your character. When they changed him to Meshach, it's referring to a pagan god named Aku, who is what Aku is. So they made this guy, instead of thinking of the Lord, to think of a pagan god and that he should live his life by him. Azariah means the Lord helps. They change his name to Abednego, which is probably a derivation of Nebo rather than Nego on the end. And Nebo was one of the gods also of Babylon, and it literally means a servant of Nebo. Instead of the Lord helps you to live for him, I'm now going to serve a pagan god, which is mentioned in Isaiah 46, verse 1, also Nebo. Interesting. I don't think the devil has really changed his tactics much, do you? The circumstances that brought them to Babylon and this plan to affect them was going to affect the way they think about things, their mental capacity. They were going to be trained in the secularism of the world. Instead of reading God's Word, they're going to make them read pagan literature. I just ask all of the audience, do you read pagan literature more than you read literature that's dedicated to the Bible and to Christ? Stop and think about it. Some of us are into a lot of books that we read that are secular. Nothing wrong with that if it's historical and all. I do think it's wrong when it's garbage. But if you're reading something that's historically of interest or a story that may be uh, fictional but has a good point, there's nothing wrong with that. But I ask you, are you reading that more than you read the Bible and other Christian literature? Very important consideration. It affects your mind. What goes into there affects how you think and what you say and how you relate to people and what you feel about things. Not only their mental capacity, but their social customs. Ask yourself, could somebody tell by your customs, your social life, as to whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian? Could they really tell? And what about religious convictions? Uh, Are we strong in what we believe so that we apply it out with the world, or we just do that when we're hanging around the Christians? Which is it? Daniel. Dare to be a Daniel. Which brings us to the second paragraph, and which we deal not simply with the circumstances that brought them to Babylon, but the convictions of Daniel and his three friends, verses 8 to 16. And I'd like you to notice the following four things about their convictions. And ask yourself if this is true of you. One, his decision was made in his heart. His mom and dad didn't push him into it. It wasn't his... Jewish friends that pushed him into it. Daniel made the decision in his heart. It says, verse 8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. A little word to parents. The Bible teaches that we are to train our kids. We all know that. Train them in the way of the Lord. Bring them discipline and instruction. The Bible also teaches that children have an old sin nature and they can rebel against everything the parents have taught. And that scares some parents. But I want you to understand something. No matter how great you're teaching, no matter what you have said, if what your kids believe is not in their own heart, but simply your convictions that they're parroting, you got a problem. you got a serious problem. And they're going to face a serious problem because you can't stand alone with the convictions of somebody else. At some point, there will be pressure upon you, some crisis, some temptation, some peer group from other kids or whatever. It will pressure you. You have to have convictions in your heart. It has to be real with you. 
Have you made the decision in your heart not to walk to what the world says? Have you made a decision in your heart to really follow Jesus Christ? Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, which means kiss goodbye to your plans, one-way trip to death, and follow me. Do you determine in your heart to follow the Lord, or do you feel the pressure when you're around the Christians or around family? Which is it? And I think none of us really know where we stand till we're out there among non-Christians and we're alone. That's where we feel it. That's where we understand it. That's where we find out what we are made of. Your reputation is just what people think you are. Your character is what God knows you to be. What are we really like? His decision was in his own heart. Number two, his determination was based on obedience to the laws of God. You can't just make up conviction. You can't just decide a set of rules. And by the way, in parental training, if it's not rooted in the teaching of the Bible, it's all going to collapse, friends. It's all going to backfire. It can't be standards that we have imposed that are not based on God's Word. We have to understand that when we teach people, teach our children, it's in the way of the Lord. Train them in the way of the Lord. Not just what you think. Uh, not just rules and arbitrary things you've set up just for a matter of personal convenience so they don't bug you. It's based on what the Bible teaches. And when we look at this passage, what a classic example to all of us. The determination of these men, these young men, was based on their obedience to the laws of God. You look at the end of verse 8. It says, Daniel purposed in his heart he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, what's that talking about? That's talking about the dietary restrictions that were in God's law, which shows us that these young Jewish men were obedient to the law of God. They did what they did because they knew what defilement was all about. They followed what God said. Number three, his dependency was upon the Lord. It was upon the Lord. I think that's very clear in the response of the chief of the eunuchs and in the 10-day test. It says in verse 10 that the eunuch chief was really concerned because if they don't look good, it's his neck. So very wisely, Daniel said in verse 12, please test your servants for 10 days. Let them give us vegetables to eat, things that are kosher and acceptable for us, and water to drink. You just let that happen. And then you can examine at the end of 10 days. Notice he didn't extend it for six months or for three years and make it difficult then for the issue to be settled. He said, we'll just take 10 days. And I tell you that a man to do that had to have dependency upon the Lord. Do you believe that you could really look great in 10 days by eating vegetables? I think if we all believe this, we'd head out and eat some greens this week, huh? <laughs> and it might be good that we do that. But the point of this is very powerful. His dependency was upon the Lord, and it's evident in the way he gave the 10-day test. He was taking a real chance. I want to ask you a question. If it didn't work, do you think Daniel would go ahead and compromise? I don't think so. You see, that's the interesting thing about the story. He purposed it in his heart, and he's not going to do it no matter what. But he sets this test up because he knows what God says, and he's going to depend upon the Lord. That tells me a lot about trusting the Lord. It's pretty hard to say you're depending upon the Lord when you don't have the moral direction and convictions from God. But see, because he had it, he knew what God's will was, so he wasn't afraid anymore, and now he's going to trust the Lord with all of his heart. Kind of interesting. What a lesson for us. If you know what God says, and what God says is right, and what God says is wrong, are the only standards of right and wrong. If you know what He says, and that conviction's in your heart, and you purpose to follow it, then you can depend upon the Lord to take care of you, because you're obedient to God. You get off of that, and you're a little shaky. Well, I'll give a 10-day test. If it doesn't work out, then I'll go along with them. Oh, no. No, that's not faith at all. That's not depending on the Lord. The fourth thing that I'd point out to you is His dedication was rewarded by God. And so will yours and so will mine. His dedication was rewarded by God. Sometimes you have to say no. Amen? Isn't it interesting our world now has commercials that say no to drugs and no to alcohol, etc., which we should have been doing long ago. But the point is that saying no is often a bigger test of character than saying yes. You are known more in terms of moral integrity by what you don't do than by what you do. 
always. His dedication was rewarded by God. At the end of 10 days, verse 15, they were better and, what's the next word? Fatter. Amen. Praise God. I underline those verses frequently. And then verse 16, the steward responds and takes it all away and gave them vegetables. What a neat way that God in His sovereignty handled this tremendous problem in a pagan society because of Daniel purposing in his heart and these young men deciding not to defile themselves with the society in which they lived and their standards, but they were going to follow the Lord. Now, we've mentioned the circumstances that brought them to Babylon, and uh, we've mentioned also the conviction of Daniel and his friends. But let's wrap it up at verse 17 and look at the comparison of these men to others. Verse 17, as for these four young men, watch this, God gave them knowledge and skill. You see, 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, you don't have anything that you didn't receive from the Lord. When you honor the Lord and determine to follow in His way, God gives you extra portions of His ability. And it said, God gave them knowledge and skill in all lit lit literature and wisdom. I'll give you one little example. Several years ago, I was at the National Religious Broadcasters, and they had a congressional prayer breakfast. The senators and congressmen are there and so forth. And I was giving the prayer, the invocation to begin this uh, breakfast, and I was sitting at the head table, and the speaker was Ben Hayden. Uh, Ben's a former CIA agent who is now the pastor of Highland Park Presbyterian Church in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Very unusual guy. Um, when I'm around him, I tell as many jokes as I can to make him lighten up. He's a very serious dude, if you ever saw him. He looks like a CIA agent and talks to you like he's a CIA agent, you know? Like you, you say something, he'll look at you with a glare and say, why did you say that? <laughs> I don't know, it just came off the cuff. We should not speak that way. Be careful what you say. Okay, yeah, right, sure, amen. Yeah, don't want to just say a meaningless word, do we? Amen. But I like Ben Hayden. I like his style. He's very penetrating. He looks at you like he's watching only you many times. I've even seen him on television. He still looks like it. I try to move off to the side, you know. <laughs> yeah. He looks like he's looking right at you. Well, on the stage of the giant Sheraton Hotel in Washington, they had all the congressmen, you know, the, the uh, senators and the uh, congressmen. They were all sitting up there, and they're lined in rows on the tables. And instead of speaking to the audience, and there's some 6,000 people out there, he turns around and decides to talk to the congressman. And he wanders up and down the rows of the tables to each man, looking at him in his eye as he's trying to drink his coffee and so forth. And his central message was one thing. If you're not morally right, then you can't possibly be politically smart. Now, can you imagine the courage of this guy? I mean, most of us sat there kept going, <gasps> The one I remembered most was McGovern. He was sitting right behind at the table. And he stood there quite a long time in front of McGovern talking to him. I think McGovern thought he was going home to be with the Lord. He was scared out of his wits. But he went down every single person and just look at him in the face and say, look, if there's something, you got a skeleton in a the closet, there's something wrong here, then you ought not to be leading our country. Why don't you just resign and get out? Now, he's just shooting off the hip, you know, to everybody going down, up and down the line. I want to tell you, nobody, including me, has ever forgot that message. I don't know if we understand this or not. But when you say no to what is wrong, God says, yes, bless him. Many of us are not growing and are not experiencing the blessing of God even though he wants to use us, because we won't say no to the world. We're saying yes to them. Give me all you got. Oh, I am a Christian. But give me everything you got. Oh, no. When you say no, God says, yes, bless him. And what a fascinating thing to learn. It's a wonderful, wonderful part of the story. Uh, verse 20 says, look at this, not just sort of better. It says they were 10 times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. 
Wow, does God bless or does God bless? Again, the little chorus. Dare to be a Daniel. Dare to stand alone. Dare to have a purpose firm. And dare to make it known. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. And Lord, I see in this opening chapter why you bless Daniel and his friends. I thank you, Lord, for the encouragement it is to us because we live in a pagan society that's pressuring us to do it their way. I think of our kids. My heart goes out to them. The pressure is enormous on the campus. We live in a society where drugs and alcohol and sexual involvement before marriage is paraded in front of us every day. And God, I would pray that you'd give us a new understanding of what it means to walk with God and to stand alone. Father, I don't know what's going on in people's lives, but you do. And you said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. God, bring many of us to the position of Daniel and his friends who purposed in their heart not to defile themselves. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.